Okay. Yay! There we go. Now Hi, we're live. Hi. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, I'm Morgan. Welcome to our second edition of the Coracle Live uh, Books, Bards, and Ballads, uh, sponsored by the Coracle Live and the Sisterhood of Avalon. Uh, tonight, we are going to be chatting with Avalon's sister, Anwen Avalon. Uh, she's a water witch, water priestess, founder of Triscoll Rose Witchcraft, and we're going to be talking to her tonight about all sorts of things. Her first book was Water Witchcraft. Her second one is Way of the Water Priestess. And um, we're just going to go from there and just see how this conversation takes us. Hi, Enwin. Hi, how are you? <laughs> how are you doing? Good, good. I just wanted to say that your eyeshadow is amazing. Um, <laughs> I, I kept meaning to say it earlier when we were checking in, but it's like this amazing green color. And every time you blink, it like sparkles or flashes a little. I love it. I got blue on too. So See, if, if she'd said that earlier, I would have showed you that it comes in a little shell. Uh, oh, so it's a green shell, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it's Tarte's Mermaid Palette. Yes. I have yes. that one. <laughs> well, yeah, it smells like cake. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my gosh, I almost put that one on, but I ended up using this really great blue from um, this other, uh, the Unicorn Palette by Too Faced. Oh, I don't have that one. Oh, the blue in there. There's one blue that I'm like obsessed. Like all the other colors are like perfect. I've never even used them. And then the blue is like down to like the bare bones. <laughs> so, um... We should do a makeup tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. That would actually be really fun. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully people can see us. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah, there's some comments over on the side. Okay, so at least uh, we're here. Okay, so Anwen, would you like to start talking about your newest book, that story you were telling earlier about pilgrimage and then coming home and starting this yeah like, yeah can I share that to go to Babylon in 2018 um and how it was like such an amazing experience and really getting to bond with people and um uh meet new people and I I had um some pretty interesting like mother and sister type of wounds that I was healing um, prior to the trip and um, it all kind of came into a little bit of a crescendo there for me and uh, I had a pretty profound experience at uh, Sulis's temple in Bath actually. Um, I wrote that up in a blog but um, you know Sulis is a goddess that I didn't really know was with me my entire life until, oh, well into my witchy priestess type of stuff. I'd, I'd been, I had just been initiated. This was way back about a decade ago and um, into witchcraft. And I was doing a lot of like research on different deities and spirits and uh, Sulis came up and there was just this amazing like knowing or pull. And then the more I researched her, the more I was like, oh my gosh, I've, I've been to this place. I've been to Bath. I was there when I was five. I was there when I was eight. Um, and uh, so my relationship with Sulis really started to, to build and grow. And I, like I said, I'd been to Bath many times, but I'd never experienced it the way that I did with the Sisterhood of Avalon because we got to go to Cross Bath, which is this um, pool type of thing that they, they have across from Thermae Spa and you actually get to immerse in Sulis's waters. You actually can't do it in the temple ruins because there's uh, the, the water um, has, oh, I can't remember. There's something wrong with it and you can actually get sick or die um, from it because there's a bacteria or something in the main um, pools at, at, at Bath. But what they've done from what I understand is they've gone down to the aquifer and brought the water up in a different area so that it's it's cleansed and, and it's it's fresh and it's, it's not, um, it's separate. There we go, that's what I'm trying to say, it's separate. Um, and so this water then, it flows up 
out of this amazing like glass ball that's set inside this vesica Pisces eye type of shape. And it, and it flows like just out of this like amazing like glass ball reminds me of um, like a crystal ball, you know, and mm -hmm. out of this eye and into the water. And um, the the experience was was quite amazing. Um, and without going into too many details, um, I kind of, we finished, we had limited time and we finished and I kind of was in one of those like dazed, kind of confused, but not confused, like dazed and massive clarity, <laughs> if that makes sense. So not dazed and confused, but dazed with clarity. Um, and uh, so, I, I went right into the temple to the temple ruins at that point after I just kind of like, like zombie zombie walked over there. Um, I grabbed something to eat and then I, I spent the rest of the day in the temple. And um, later on we came back to Glastonbury and um, the following day, I, I just, it was, it was so profound and so important um, to me that I took the little ticket from Bath with Sulis's head, you know, just her little bronze bust and a small little cup. And I went into the garden and I picked like one flower and I went over to the mother shrine. Um, and I, I did a little rededication type of ritual um, to her. And since then, <laughs> Since then, I really haven't been, I mean, I've honored other spirits and other deities, um, but since then, she's really taken uh, a big step forward into my life, and at this point, I'm starting to identify as a priestess of Sulis, um, her priestess, rather than, um, well, I shouldn't say rather than, but that's where I'm at right now, um, but I came back from that, and it it there was there was changes there was difference that something had changed something had stirred and I had lots of ideas for books but that is really then when water priestess started flowing out came back I I've never written something so fast in my life it was as if well, parts of it are channeled they have to be um I got the box, you know, they, they send you your first box of books. And I remember opening it and, and reading through it. And I flipped open to this one section and I started reading and I was like, I don't remember writing this. I don't remember at all. And then it was like, of course I wrote it. Like, of course it was me. This is, they, we triple checked. I triple checked. They triple checked. Um, but it just had, I just had this moment of understanding that, okay, maybe it's like I wrote it, but it was written through me, if that makes sense. Do you feel that she guided you? Yeah. The, the yes. writing of the book? I do. I really do. And um, I just think it's so important. And there's this, this movement towards sacred water and having this connection with water and being in service to water and the water spirits and water goddesses. It's, uh, I feel like water's time is now and it's, it's rising. Um, and that's really what Water Priestess was all about, was writing a, a guide for anybody to be able to walk the path of water. And that was, that was hard actually. Now, I will say that I'm very thankful because my teachers um, were very dualistic. I had one teacher that was like deep and dark and all of the uh, deepest, darkest, witchy stuff that you can think of. And then my other teacher is a Reiki master and a healer and a massage therapist and crystals. And so I really ended up with this like wonderful two ends of the spectrum. And while I do gravitate more towards witchcraft, the spirits were urging me, the water was urging me to make something, to, to produce something that other people could use, regardless of what my preference was or my path. What if there was someone out there that was a Christian and wanted to walk the path of the water priestess? What if there was somebody that maybe was more into Eastern religions and wanted to walk it? Or what if you just 
were spiritual with no particular type of um, vein of magic, then you could pick it up. So it's really a non path specific guide. But that being said, of course, since I lean towards the Celtic mysteries and all of that, it's definitely um, woven in there. You know, I, I couldn't take those things out, but um, I really wanted it to be accessible for anybody. Um, and so far, feedback, it, it has been. It's been great. Um, even though it's called the Way of the Water Priestess, I do have great feedback from um, our masculine friends as well, um, saying basically, like, this is a great guide. I had no problem turning this work into my own. Um, and that's, that's fantastic because um, water, I mean, we are water. We are made of water, 60, 70% water. But honestly, on a molecular level, we're like 99% water. And then if you take that, we are water. We're vessels of water. And then if you take that and you look at what's happening with water and the privatization of water and all of these things, I it, it, it's scary. It's really kind of scary to see water be privatized like that. So I thought to myself, you know, what if water was sacred? What if we followed in the footsteps of our indigenous brothers and sisters who are raising awareness by walking for with you know the water walkers? Um, you know, we also have to be careful not to show up to our indigenous brother and sisters events and be like, I'm here and take over and run with it. And I was like, what do we have? Like, what do we have as a pagan community, as a metaphysical community, as a magical community? Um, you know, what do we have? What what can we do that parallels that, that, that supports that, that boosts it up, that, that says, yes, we see what you're doing and we're going to do that too, but within our own framework. Um, so, so yeah, sorry, long, long tangent here. No, 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 that's great. That's great. So in the book, I haven't got too far into it myself. So is it a path for the water priestess or is your, uh, as, as Jenna says, your activism, is that included in the book as well? Or is it more from the spiritual aspect of it? It's, it's both. There, it's it both. really is both because I, I personally don't see a separation. Um, there's so I will say in water witchcraft there are like specifically spells to protect the dolphins or protect the water or bind corporations so there's that kind of stuff actually in water witchcraft but in water priestess it's more about finding your path as a water priestess because even even within water there's, there's so much because we have people that do body work in water, like Watsu or actual water healing. There's this wonderful lady um, on Instagram that she puts the, the floaties on your arms and legs and you lay in the water and she does the Reiki and the energy healing right wow. there in the water. Um, and then there's people that do birthing in the water, um, midwives that, that do that kind of uh, mm -hmm. the water births. And then there are things like, um, what if you, you are called to that activism? And what if there is an oil spill? What, what can you do with that? Can you protect it? Can you heal it? Can you get involved with it physically? So there's really, in, in both books, this connection between the magical, spiritual things but then how we can also do that in, in, in the physical world. So for example, one of my students um, that I've, I've years ago, she, she took one of my courses and just woke up to water. I mean, she was just like, this is it. This is my path. She's an amazing, um, amazing water witch. And, um, you know, she's not very public about it, but what she did was she actually got involved in her local river cleanup. So she would, physically go there and pick up the trash and put it in the bucket. But while she would do that, she was doing the energy work. She was doing the magic. She would prepare before she would go um, herbal waters and magical waters and blessed waters and take them to then re like, so you physically clean and then you spiritually bless and clean and protect 
Um, and so, yeah, like I just, uh, I don't see a big separation between them. Um, I feel like at least for me, they're, they're one and the same. Um, but yeah, there's so many different paths of water that I touch a little bit on different things of like, hey, if you're called to the water, you don't have to just be called to activism. You don't have to just be called to being a midwife and, and doing water births. Uh, mm -hmm. What if you're called to do healing um, ceremonies for your community? Um, you know, a lot of people that I work with, they start doing full moon ceremonies with blessed water where they go around to everybody in the circle during full moon and blessing them with water. Um, and so there's, there's so many different layers. Um, and uh, it's just the beginning. I think it, it just touches on it. Um, there's, I, I suspect over time that there'll be more people that are inspired and maybe they'll write something deeper. Um, I've started to see actually books coming out on water goddesses that are singular books, not the water goddesses. Like um, there's a brand new book um, on Yamaya that is getting ready to release. Um, I don't think that there has been a book written specifically about her. Um, I've also seen a new one coming out by um, about the goddess uh, Anahita. Anah 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 um, she's uh, very, very ancient, but, but these are like tech, like big, thick books that we didn't have years and years ago. We weren't, you know, this kind of research and this type of stuff was only in academia and all of a sudden people are bridging it. Academia is there, but now it's like, it's accessible to, to other people thanks to Amazon and books and stuff like that. So. And I think so much of it for people who are actually drawn to water to start with, even before getting into this, they just know they have that feeling inside that, you know, they have to, they have to be at the water. Um, I'm about an hour from the beach and I know when I get, whether it's tense or stressed or upset or whatever, I get in the car and that's, that's the first place I, I go is the ocean. But I think we also have to take into consideration that now, now more and more people are aware that there's this big plastic island in the middle of the ocean that's, you know, the size of Texas and that we need to protect the water. Mm -hmm. or hopefully the, our descendants are not going to have water to survive. And then, right. uh, and for the people that think like that, that's important and they they reach out whether whether it's just the activism without the spiritual part like just trying to do something about that or meshing it so would you suggest to someone on um, just starting for your first book or to start with way of the probably, the, the way of the water priestess probably is is uh, my my recommendation um you know, I I was def I'm definitely a new newer author with the first book, um, and the the thing is, is both of when I first turned in my manuscript for Water Witchcraft, it was way too big. Um, I I learned a lot, a lot of stuff with the first one. Um, I was contracted for fifty thousand, and I sent them ninety one. So as you can imagine, <laughs> they kicked it back. Um, so there was some of that that did go into Water Priestess, but it was really, really hard to decide what went where. Um, and Water Witchcraft came out first because I think of my my love and borderline obsession with water spirits, um, mermaids and thin folk and um, selkie, everything that the Kelpie, I like, Ever since I was young, I just have had this fascination with them. So um, it, I think it came out first because it was just like, I want to study all of this information and share it with so many people. But it does focus a lot more on folklore and folk magic and folk stories where Water Priestess focuses the, the history and the that section focuses more on sacred women very specifically looking at the Oracle of Delphi, for example. Um, why, is, why is Delphi Delphi? Well, it's connected with, um, there's this team that's learning uh, and, and studying the different constellations. And 
um, Apollo's temple door is aligned with the rising of the constellation Delphinius. And they're trying to figure out like the timing of it and why. And there's another of Apollo's temple that also um, aligns with the setting of, of that constellation. And so it's interesting because I never really put it together, but Delphinius is the dolphin. And yeah. Yeah, wow. Right? So then as I was looking through this, we learned that the Pythia would bathe in the sacred springs before her prophecies. And so I was like, okay, there's stuff here. There's a lot of stuff here. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started looking into the nines, the nine muses, the nine priestesses, all of the groups of nine maidens and seeing lots of parallels there. Even the Christian story versions of the stories I could look at and be like, I, I I can see where this went from paganism to here to you know Christianity um and and tracing it back and I'm really kind of looking at those and being like haha okay here's a nugget there were nine women on this island and they practiced this way and then there were these other nine women and they practiced this way I feel like water like the water path has always 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 been here on this planet but forgotten to, to time, to history. Um, and so really what I feel like is we have these large puzzle pieces and there's one here and there's one here and there's one here and there's one here. And you can't really say that they're all linked. It's not like it's this lineage that we can track. It's it's a broken lineage where we can find this this particular thing is here in history. This particular thing is here in history. This is. And looking at those parallels and saying, oh, okay, we see some similarities. Um, and so the that that's more of the, the background of it. And then we I take those things and I'm like, okay, look, like we look at prophesying, divination, that is important. We look at um, you know herbalism and being able to kind of have that gift of healing and the association of healing and water and kind of pulling that through and and looking at that in more of a modern context because um back in my early days I wanted to be a Celtic reconstructionist so bad I loved it so much I like I was I was ready to give up everything and go live in a roundhouse and um <laughs> it occurred to me that that was not going to happen and that while we can look at all of these ancient practices and, and all of these different things the truth of the matter is we all live in a modern world and what the ancient celts did however we want to romanticize it isn't necessarily going to work in our society for example driving a chariot into a lake as a votive offering in antiquity. That would have been a thing. We know because in archaeology, they found stuff, right? Driving your brand new Prius into your local pond is probably just going to get you arrested. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have to adapt, right? Like we have to learn and we have to adapt and we have to kind of bring it into this modern context. Um, and so I feel like with Water Priestess, that's, that's what I've attempted to do. Um, and there's a strong focus on ritual and doing ritual type of things like sacred bathing or setting up a shrine or an altar, um, going to the river and doing a water blessing, even things like sacred adornment, because you wouldn't think that dressing up to do your priestess work is really important, but it is. Um, and it is for a couple of reasons. One, what you wear matters. How we adorn ourselves does matter because it makes us feel good. And if we're feeling good, we're, we're in that center, we're in that place of power. Um, and so we, we talk about that. And, and in my intro to Water Priestess, I have a free little Water Priestess intro on my website. Um, it's one of the things that we talk about is kind of getting over that, like, what if somebody sees me? Um, and and my my response is, what if they do? And then what if they want to join you? What if they see you and they're like, what are you doing? Because that would have been me. I would have been that you know teenage girl on the beach being like, I don't know what's happening, but those women are beautiful, and I don't know why their hands are up, and I don't know why they're singing. 
but that's what I want. Um, so, yeah, just kind of that that idea of getting over that. What if people see us? Well, what if they do? Like, what if they do? And then what if they understand that, hey, people revere the water as sacred? Um, and what happens if we could actually start to protect these bodies of water? Um, so, so that's definitely a huge section of, of water priestess, but there's also um, a sec, like, there's also not so much activism involved. So if that's not your thing, that's okay too, because you don't, not everybody has to be a water activist um, to, to make an impact. For example, I personally am not on a local river cleanup, but one of my students is, and I know that my work, even though it's not identical to hers, is it has inspired her. And I know that people have been out there seeing her and that's gonna inspire. And so it's just like, it's just like throwing that pebble into the water and then watching it ripple out into the world. And it, it's happening. I had, um, I gave one of my scholarships away for my um, intermediate water priestess training to a girl in India this year who is working with the Ganges River. Wow. And it's huge. It's, 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 it's amazing. And uh, like I said, I hope it's just the beginning. So why don't you, you mentioned your courses. Why don't you tell us a little bit about those? I know you have different levels. So um, if you wouldn't mind talking about those, what, how many levels, what's involved with each one? Sure. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a couple different things. So I'll briefly mention Trisco Rose, which is my coven tradition where um, traditional Celtic Avalonian witchcraft, um, those are in person. We only have three locations, Arizona, North Carolina, and Oregon. Okay. But if you don't live in those places, that's okay, because I have two other websites. One's waterwitchcraft.com, and that one focuses on witchcraft. I have my nine-month water magic course on there. starts every March, um, as well as it's not up right now, but I have a Water Magic 101 that um, released last year, and I'll be getting ready to re-release it on my website this summer. Um, so if you're interested in like basics, keep an eye out because it's coming back. Um, and then over at waterpriestess.com, I have a, a layers of classes. So there's a free intro, um, and it's just me being just like this, just be like, hi, let's do the things. <laughs> I'm a little bit maybe too animated and a little bit too excited on them, but I was really happy to record them. Um, and, you know, I just set up, we, we set up altars. We talk about the sacred adornment. And by the end of it, I get you to go to your local water source and do your own water blessing. And then if you like that, um, then I have paid courses after that. I do offer scholarships um, and I try and keep them affordable. Like right now they're 99 for um, the like 11 months. It's, it, I'm, probably, I'm probably not charging enough, but I try and keep it uh, low because I, I want it to be accessible. Um, and in that one, that's where we really start to get serious. And it's not just about learning how to ground and learning how to shield. So in the, like we start out with grounding, that's the first thing. So you actually learn how to ground my way. And then I walk you through how to create your own. And same thing with shielding. You start with shielding and you do it my way. And then the next week I ask you to branch out, like lose a little bit of the structure I've given you. And the next week lose even more structure. And the last week, put your own flair on it. So I'm, I'm helping people to build their little magical toolbox for their communities. And we go through uh, cleansing, purification, different types of waters. Then this is a huge deal for me, getting to the local environment, working in your local environment or with a particular body of water is really, really important. So, um, we go through sacred wells and springs, lakes, the ocean, um, and rivers. And if you live near one, you're encouraged to go to that place, learn about it, like in act, like research it. What 
what feeds the river? What, where does the water come from? What kind of fish are in there? Um, and to work with it that way. But if you don't say that when we get to the beach lesson, if you're in Montana, you certainly are not going to be able to go to the beach. So I have these um, alternative ways. And this is where modern technology is amazing. You can do things like Google Earth and put this particular beach or body of water right there and do satellite view on your computer screen and set up an altar and do your magical work. That's a great idea. Right, and connecting with it that way. Um, so then we, we spend a month on the different bodies of water and we, we build a shrine and we create um, a spirit of place. And so you you really have to to go there, sorry, spirit of place jar, where you, you go to that local place and maybe you find a piece of driftwood and some sand mm -hmm. and you, you put it together in this jar, you bring it back to the altar and you continue doing your work and then you you continue to then build a relationship with the the genie loki the local spirits um so so that's a really big part of what we do in the water priestess uh course and then there's consecutive ones after that um so i've got a couple new things coming up um like the celestial water priestess which is going to focus more on astrological timing of our workings um and what is this flower moon what what is doing a full moon ritual gemini even mean you know like different things like that so um yeah so so it's it's growing the water priestess work is growing um and i encourage anybody that might be interested to just check out the website waterpriestess.com because even if you don't like me or my work or my style, that's totally fine. Not everybody's for everybody, right? Like some people absolutely love pizza. Other people don't, you know, nothing wrong with the pizza. Um, <laughs> the people who don't like pizza? <laughs> who are those people? No. <laughs> but, you know, everybody's different. And so I'm not the only water priestess and I won't be. Um, there's always been others. In fact, I consider Dion Fortune to be like the first, right? Um, because of Sea Priestess. Um, although I, I doubt she was the first, but she's like the first modern um, water priestess. And uh, so there's a interview series that I keep on the website. And to date, I think that we've done maybe nine of them. And I've got I've got two or three more coming. The the lady that I told you about that does the water healing, she's working on one right now. I've got Lilith Dorsey. Um, she sent hers in. There's a wonderful um girl, uh, her name's Dakota, and she comes from more the metaphysical side of things. She lives in Hawaii and lives as a full-time water priestess as well. Um, and she's actually associated with the website uh, springfinder. I, it might be .org or .com, I'm not sure, but um, they host this website that actually helps people find local drinking water. Um, and, oh, and a live water, which is where this this wonderful glass drinking bottle comes from. A beautiful bottle. Yeah, with the, the sacred geometry on there is quite fascinating. Um, so I've also done an interview with the caretakers of the White Spring um, and Gaia, who actually I saw was gonna also be doing one of these coming up. Um, yes. I have hers on there as well. It's called, um, it's a little bit different named, um, but it's a girl who found a well. I'm, I love her story so much about how these spirits gave her this dream and drew her to this. Um, but, but this is kind of what I'm talking about with like, I feel like it's just the beginning. It's just stirring because when you read her story, her account, you just kind of are like, yeah, like, yes, like there's, it's stirring. Even the spirits, the water spirits know, and they're reaching out to people that are perceptive and receptive to being able to not run away from a, a you know, a scary dream, but to go into the forest and to find the water. Um, and I even have, I've got a couple people that identify as shamans. Um, Annika is the sea priestess that was out of doorstep for a while. And, um, Oh, uh, Ness Bosch, um, who does um, the the Scottish Goddess Temple, 
um, as well. So, so there's there's a lot. Uh, oh, Covenant of the Waters. That's what she is. Um, so Ness uh, runs Covenant of the Waters. Um, and so I have. Do they, all, do they all teach? So some of them do, some of them don't. Um, I know Dakota has a water priestess um, like immersion. And I know that the Covenant of the Waters also has a program. So there's there's other people out there. And I've compiled this um, this page that hosts their picture and, and who they are. And that takes mm -hmm. you directly to that interview. So even you know if you're looking for somebody to teach and you don't like my work, or if you're just like wanting to be like, who are these women that are connected with water and, and what are they doing? But but that's why I'm so excited and so like um, enthusiastic about like sharing other people's work is because it's not just me. There's tons of other people doing this, people who I haven't even discovered. Um, oh, there's a wonderful lady named Takara that does um, dolphin work. Um, in fact, she found me when Water Priestess came out. She messaged me and was like, I've been doing this kind of work for 20 years. I had no idea. Um, and she's, I believe, like Australia and New Zealand. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it's just really fascinating to, to see these these small ripples, these little bubbles that they're bubbling bigger and bigger and bigger um, and uh, supporting other watery women or, or, or men is, you know, is fine too. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of amazing stuff happening. So is, is the water work involved with your Trisco Rose witchcraft or? So yes, no. Um, so it's hard to separate the water from me. Um, but um, I, my, my original training was to make sure that I was a well-rounded magical practitioner, having a really good connection with all of the elements. Mm -hmm. Um, and so while yes, you know, it's hard to take the water out, um, because all of our spirits that we work with are somehow connected with water for the most part. Um, <clears throat> maybe blood eye with is maybe the only one that's not a hundred percent like water goddess um but yeah there's there's some connection here and there to water so it's kind of hard to take them out like for instance like sulis is one of the goddesses that we work with um as well as we work with gwen up nith so and, you know he's connected with the white spring and sulis with bath even bridget um having so many watery um, right. uh, sacred places throughout throughout the world um so yeah, it's hard to take the water out, but it is not a water program, nor is it water focused. Um, after the the basics, after the, the typical um, program, there is different elemental paths that you can take if you're interested. So, of course, I have the water, <laughs> but we also have um, an initiate that leads the air section. She does a lot of work with birds um, and um you know, writing and poetry and all of those things. But there's there's a little bit of environmental activism there because some of that work is doing community service. We have an earth, um, an earth section where we, you know, same thing, growing plants, maybe giving them to some of the food banks um, and, and really having this focus on protecting and healing the earth. Um, and then we do have fire. Our fire um, program is actually internal. It's um, it's not a public community public service, um, public community service. I said that backwards. <laughs> public community service. It's not what it is. Is they're the heart tenders, the soul tenders, the flame, the flame in the heart, and so their community service is actually supporting the Triscoll Rose, so that the others can go out and do public community service um, and workings. So yes, it's still, there's a big water aspect to it, but it's not a water program. Now, sometimes, you know, when, when I first started feeling drawn to water, it was always the ocean. So it wasn't until I started reading with your book, it's like almost as if you forget there's rivers and there's ponds and there's lakes and there's streams and they're all connected, but the ocean is just so, Oh, yeah. yeah, it's so 
there's a saying where all water is one water. And I don't believe that. Um, unpopular opinion. Um, but I, I don't think so. Because if you're living in the mountains where there is a clear flowing spring that just like comes right out and you're working with that, it is not the same as ocean energy um, or ocean water. You can't drink ocean water. And so I, I, I just think that it's so, it's so vast. Um, and so we have sea priestesses and people that work specifically with that sea energy. But, and, and this actually, my own personal gnosis here is this, this is kind of how I figured out like, I, I was connected with water is after years and years and years of living on the beach, near the beach, walking distance to the beach, uh, viewing just over the cliff, the beach. Um, I found myself in Arizona and I felt like I couldn't identify as a sea priestess because I was six hours away and I started searching for water. Of course I found it. Even in the middle of the desert, where you think there's no water, there are sacred sites. Um, there's a hot spring. Tonopah Hot Spring is in Arizona. Um, I mean, there's waterfalls down in Tucson. Um, there's beautiful rivers that do flow through. And then just outside of Sedona is Montezuma as well, which, um, and I've got info on my blog about this as well. Um, Sedona's Sacred Waters is what it's called. But this basin actually is, it's, it's quite ancient and it um, is believed by the, um, oh gosh, many, I think Hopi and a couple of the other indigenous tribes that were there, that this was where Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl, there we go, I said it wrong, <laughs> the winged serpent um, fell from the heavens into this particular body of water or other versions where the, the plumed serpent lives in this and rises. Um, and there's even in some, um, some versions, they call this an archangel, the winged serpent archangel, which I always find very interesting too. So even out in these desert locations, we have magical bodies of water that were revealed, revered by the indigenous that magical or um, spiritual people um, in their communities lived there and worshipped and honored these particular spirits. And that's the other thing then is connection with spirit and having this um, so many parallels to the sacred wells that we find in the UK. Um, even though in the UK we don't have stories of Quetzalcoatl coming down, what we have are fairy women. Um, but there's parallels through this. And it it honestly kind of blew my mind. I mean, this is, this is now like maybe 10 years ago, um, a decade ago. But I remember it kind of like blowing my mind being like, we have right here. There's magical water spirit beings that are recorded in um, oral history and, and in some cases written. Um, and so when you look at that, though, and compare that with sea lore, it's very, very different. So it's it, in my opinion, I see sacred wells, springs and founts as being one type of water and the ocean being another and lakes, lakes, locks, and rivers being another. Fresh water and salt water is a really good way to kind of um, distinguish the two. But here's the thing, there are overlaps because there are spring-fed rivers, there are locks that are spring-fed, but then there's locks that don't have springs and rivers that aren't spring-fed. Um, and so sometimes you get an overlap with, okay, this is spring water, but now it's ocean water. And then that ocean water does eventually flow, sorry, river water does eventually flow towards the ocean, but it's still not the same. And then there's this like really fascinating well, um, I believe it's in Scotland, where it's the the beach is right here, the water's coming up to the cliff, right? And it's hit, and there's the, the uh the wells are right there, like on the beach. So you have the salt water coming in and filling these pools, these basins of fresh water. 
So while it, while I'm like, they're very, very different at the same time, there's a connection and they're, they intermingle and flow together. Um, but water's always been strange like that. Um, in South America, Cenote Angelita is um, believed to, oh, no, it's not believed, it's fact that it's, you've got the cenote, so you've got this like basin of water. And if you go down deep enough, you pass through sediment and there's a river underneath the water. Um, so basically now you have two bodies of water on top of each other. And um, the place that's outside of Sedona that I was talking about has a false bottom as well. And so there's this mystery and magic and diversity and um, this fluid understanding of being distinctly different, but still one, if that makes sense. That's wonderful. So I'm gonna ask the last question before we start to wrap up. Um, where do you see yourself going from here in terms of your water work, your water service? Now the book coming or? So I have two projects that I'm working on that aren't contracted yet. So I'm not saying anything, but okay. um, I will say that yes, I am working on more watery things um, for sure. Um, I have more writing on water coming, um, but also I'm gonna be branching out just a little bit. Um, so I, yeah, water is coming. And then on the tail end of that is something a little bit different. Um, so I'm excited about that. I'm hoping by August, I can actually announce what it is. Um, but I'm, I'm always writing blogs. Like I say, I've got, I've got new interviews coming up. Um, I'm gonna be re-releasing the Water Magic 101 and I continue to work with my, my current students. Um, but I don't, it, it's so hard. Um, I, I never thought that I'd even be here. Um, I, my very first magical lesson that I ever wrote was, it started, so I was, I was in a formal course and I started writing with, I can't write. My very first turned in homework like the first paragraph basically is like, I can't write. This is like, I, I don't understand like how to do these things, but like, I'm going to put in a lot of effort. You're going to see that I'm doing magic. You're going to, you know, you'll be proud of me. Just like, please, like, please weed through the lines. I'm so sorry. And that was some major shadow work. And I just kept getting better and better. And I ended up going back to college. I got my anthropology degree because I had to, someone had to teach me how to research and how to write. Um, and so then then on the tail end of that came water witchcraft. Um, and so I don't know, because I, if you had asked me in 2013, if I would be here with a second book, I probably would have been like, oh, shut up, never. <laughs> Are you kidding? Like if you had even told me maybe in 2017, the year, the year or two before my, my signed my contract, you told me that, hey, guess what? Like, snap yeah. out five years into the future, I would have been like, you're a liar. That's not happening. Um, but now I just have this drive to get better and continue, like you, the concept of the golden shadow, taking that thing that, that scares you, that you're afraid of, that you're not good at, and transforming it. Um, so I, I'm just gonna let the goddess take me. Um, you know, so many times I sat in front of my computer and I was like, nope, I can't do this. You guys tasked the wrong person. There are so many better people out there that could write this. There's so much, uh, you know, always, always trying to tell the spirits, you, you could have picked better than this until one day I was like, no, they picked you. And now you got to, now you got to step it up. You really got to step up your game. So I feel like that's where I'm at right now is just trying to step up my game and make make the water spirits proud, make um, make things accessible for other people. And, you know, for that person that, that 15 years ago, or where I was 15 years ago, which was, man, I'm, I'm called to the water, but there's nothing. There's nothing about it. Making sure that someone that's in that same place has something. Um, 
so yeah, you know, it's, uh, I've got a lot of stuff happening, but nothing to, I, I wish that I could give you something more cr concrete. No, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, I will ask you just, uh, let everybody know that, um, the Coracle will be sponsoring you in a workshop on yes. June 26th. Yes. I want to say the 25th and I, I keep messing that up. It's Saturday, the 26th. Um, Path of the Healing Waters. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about kind of what we touched on a little bit about how there's so many different ways to heal with water and how water has healed and how we can use that as a vehicle for spiritual, emotional, and maybe um, some health benefits because some of the sacred springs actually do have minerals that can physically benefit you. So it goes everywhere from the actual physical water having these um, positive properties to the spiritual side that can be utterly transformational. That's great. Um, if anyone has the link to the Eventbrite uh, for... Anwen's workshop, I don't happen to happen to have it handy. So if anybody has that um, and wants to post it, that would be great. But if not, it is definitely on the Sisterhood of Avalon Facebook page. And it's also been posted on the Sisterhood of Avalon's Instagram page. So after having this conversation, it sounds like the workshop is going to be wonderful. Yeah, I hope so. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I I did I took a workshop with you. Oh, what do we? It's five years ago. No, I can't believe it. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Time is going way too fast. Yeah, I mean, I can't believe it was that long, but it was at the first ninefold, and you were great. So, I'm really looking forward to this workshop. I've and, only um, gotten better too. I've gotten more confidence, and <laughs> I've uh, I've I've gotten uh, I, I flow much better. Um, the G Gina. Gina Jenna, um, Gina Jenna. <laughs> um, has put some really cool stuff in the comments um, over here about bath um, and what we had talked about mm -hmm. uh, that uh, cross bath and, and actually someone lost their life in the 80s um, in the, the temple um, ruins water, not cross bath um, from what I understand. And then, yeah, she's got some cool stuff over here. Um, on the side um oh it's a it's a path a deadly pathogen okay um yeah and i just wanted to read see some of the other if there was anything else over here on the side yeah so did the person die from just bathing in the water um from what i understand um there was some sort of back like i think they ingested it or it went into their their nose of some sort is it one of those like strange amiibo things i'm actually not 100 percent sure um maybe maybe someone will post i don't know um i just uh my my um bath knowledge my knowledge about water is is very very specific there like when it comes to the sciencey type of things like this my brain is like yeah okay but I can tell you about some crazy folk story, word for word, that I heard about the place. So um, I really absorb the magical side of things. Um, so, yeah. Oh, um, California, another drought. Um, so, yeah. If, so we've got a little bit of time. Oregon and California, both. So I actually live in Oregon as well. And um, last year's fires were terrifying. Um, I evacuated my home with 30 minutes notice. Um, and I stayed in a hotel for a week in Washington state. We had to leave. Um, and the fire came about 150 feet to my property, but my property, I have a, a scorched mark on my deck. That's it. Um, but the corner of the property right up here about 150 feet north of it is where it stopped and the crazy part about it is I was doing my final edits my final edits for water priestess were due the week I evacuated my home because 
of this fire and because of the drought and just kind of the magnitude of that. There were definitely moments where it was very emotional, that last part, because there were moments where I'm trying to edit this book so that people like us can take a stand and can make an actual change in this world, whether that's being a lovely nurturing support or if that's being a fierce water warrior, you know, it like, and there, there was my house, my property that I've been working on for years now, trying to, to make this wonderful, magical place. And, and the water, I've got a creek that comes right through here and the, the fires came so close. And uh, it was, it, it was a bit mind blowing that here I am writing this book that hopefully is going to inspire not just this generation or the next generation. Maybe there's maybe there's a child that hasn't even been born yet that's going to pick this book up, get so mad about what's happening with water that she mm -hmm. revolutionizes everything. Um, so, yeah, to be in that place of of running from the fire and the drought and and all of the destruction, um, and then doing the final edits on Water Priestess was. It's emotional even now, um, and oh, I'm sure. it's uh, I I'm not looking forward to this year's uh, fire season. In fact, um, last month we got our first emergency alert that there was a fire, um, and all of us stood there kind of dumbfounded, looking at our cell phones, being like, "Fire in in April." Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, sorry, it's June now, so probably six weeks ago. But, <laughs> you know, but looking at our phones, just being like, what? Like, we have till September, <laughs> you know? Um, so it's, the droughts are, are here. They're already happening. Um, the, the climate change is going to affect everything. So it doesn't matter if it's April, September, or, you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And, you know, we talked a little bit about that, um, doing better for the environment earlier when, when we were doing tech and how um, one of the things that, that I've just been trying to do is lessen my impact um, on the environment, on the destruction of the environment, you know, um, trying to just be better a better human to the planet, a better steward to the planet. And it's hard because we talked about like, this, um, you know, you, you're you thirsty, so you buy a bottle of water and then it's plastic. Um, but one of like three things that I've done this year were I switched from paper towels into unpaper towels, which are actually here's one. Oh, yeah, show them those. Yeah, it's a reusable. This one's lighter colored, so it's a little bit dirty. Plus, this one was dirty. And they um, you just wash them and they lay flat back out and you just kind of stack them. And then you just roll them right back. So they actually sit on a, a um, paper towel roll. Um, I saved one of my cardboard paper towels and I just roll them right back up. Um, and so it's just one extra little small load. It's not even an extra. Honestly, I still do the, the dish towels. So I just throw them there, throw them in there. Um, the other one was shampoo bottles and conditioner bottles. Um, I moved over to bars using shampoo bars. Um, Lush is, is a good company and there's others out there as well. But just in the past six months, I think that I've lessened. Um, so I would have used probably six conditioner bottles and probably three shampoo bottles. And so there's nine bottles now that I have not put back into the world. Um, and then uh, straws. I've moved over to metal straws um, and trying to, to do that kind of stuff. So so even just in my everyday life, um, you know, knowing how yeah, climate change, what we're doing to the planet, the fast paced world and how it we can, we as a collective can destroy so much faster than we can repair. Um, I'm just trying really hard to lessen my own impact. Um, and uh, and looking at that, you know, it's not easy. It's not 100 percent. You can't always you can't always do it. Um, and it's it's difficult. But I think like as a collective, if we all just are conscious and are like, oh, I'm going to make this step to make the improvement. I think it'll go a long way. Well, if everyone takes one little step, it's all going to add up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Anwen, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, Sydney has posted the link to um, the Eventbrite page for Anwen's 
workshop at the end of the month. So I encourage everybody to go and sign up. It's going to be wonderful. And um, just as a little plug for next month for our Coracle Live books, books, bards, and ballads, I'll be chatting with our wonderful founder and Morgan of the Sisterhood of Avalon, Jenna Tellendrew. So hopefully you all be here to catch that on July 7th and to be with us with Anwen on June 25th. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you for having me and letting me yammer on and no problem. <laughs> my job that much easier. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed being here and, and talking and sharing with everybody. It was great. And we'll see you in what, three weeks? Yeah. And we we'll hope to do this again. And uh, so have a wonderful evening. Um, I'll see the rest of you next month and we'll see you in three weeks. All right. Thank you so much. Bye, have everybody. Have a nice night, everyone. Blessings.